Welcome. We are excited to have you join us for this webinar, Nutrition Strategies to Enhance Athletic Development, led by registered dietitian Randy Bird. My name is Callie Yakubishan, and I am a registered dietitian and manager of food and nutrition outreach at the Dairy Alliance. In addition to this webinar, you can find more resources on sports nutrition for high school athletes by going to the sports nutrition page on the VHSL website. Without further ado, I will introduce Randy and I'm going to turn it over to him so we can get started. Randy Bird is in his 12th year as the Director of Sports Nutrition for the University of Virginia. In addition to his role in UVA Athletics, Randy is an instructor for nutrition courses in the Kinesiology Department. Prior to coming to UVA, Randy was a sports nutritionist for the University of Kansas for five years. He was one of the founding members of the Collegiate and Professional Sports Dietitians Association, and he has served on the Board of Directors as Treasurer, Vice President, President, and Past President. Currently, as an ambassador for, for CPSDA, Randy's focus is collegiate sports nutrition. He served a three-year term as a voting member of the NCAA Committee on Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sport. He is currently a member of the NCAA Drug Testing Appeal Subcommittee. Wow. Well, I will turn it over to you, Randy, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say today. Great. Thank you. So today, we're, we're discussing nutrition strategies for the high school athlete. And first, I want to start off by thanking the Virginia High School League and the Dairy Alliance for asking me to speak. Uh, so without further ado, let's, let's get started. So to start with, uh, generally, what I like to say is the food we eat serves three major functions. It provides fuel. Uh, so that's that energy source for athletes. It provides the raw uh, material for tissue development. So if you're trying to gain muscle, um, that would be where the raw material would come in and then provides chemical components that regulate all functions in the body. So whether that's brain function, your heart, your lungs, uh, the muscles that we're using, it's providing the chemical components that allow that to work. So with all of that, it's essential that you have a balance of nutrients every day. Uh, and the way the world's going right now with uh, different viruses popping up, um, it's important that we have a strong immune system. And, and I love this diagram of how uh, multiple facets affect our immune system. So you can see the exercise that you do as an athlete can impact your immune system. Stress that you put on your body or stress from school can impact your immune system. Being sick uh, weakens your immune system. Uh, the great thing is the food that we eat so the nutrition component of your uh, daily routine can impact all of those. So the food we eat impacts the exercise and how your body responds to exercise. So that impacts your immune system. Uh, the food we eat uh, can help you handle stress, reduce stress, and therefore strengthen your immune response. Uh, and then also the food we eat once you're sick can help you recover and can also strengthen your immune system to keep you uh, from getting sick. Uh, so it's very important that we are paying attention to the food that we're putting in our body. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how that food impacts our body. Uh, so when you exercise, uh, one of the hormones that increases is called cortisol. So cortisol is released by the adrenal glands, and it can be released when your blood sugar drops. So as you're using fuel through exercise, or if you haven't eaten enough, uh, then cortisol can be released under periods of stress. Uh, and that's where intense exercise comes in. Uh, but also a common thing that I see with athletes, both high school and college athletes is sleep deprivation. So that will raise your cortisol levels. Resistance exercise. Uh, that is also uh, a cause for cortisol to be released at a higher rate. And the issue is cortisol causes more breakdown, so more muscle breakdown. So we want to eat in a fashion that's going to help suppress cortisol levels uh, and therefore allow for greater retention of the muscle that you have. So <clears throat> when we have high levels of cortisol in the blood, um, you will see lower concentration of immune function, uh, and failure to meet uh, your nutrient requirements throughout the day is going to cause a greater risk of you getting sick. Uh, and then 
one of our goals as professionals is to allow you to be on the field, on the court, uh, in the pool, whatever, whatever sport you're playing, to have you be available to participate. Obviously, if you're sick, then you're not going to be able to participate. Uh, and an easy way to protect against that is making sure we are eating a balanced diet, eating enough food, and therefore we're going to suppress cortisol and not not have these negative side effects occur. So tips to improve your nutritional quality throughout the day and strengthen your immune system. So first, eat foods high in antioxidants. Uh, antioxidants are nutrients found in a lot of plant-based foods uh, that help your body respond to what's called oxidative stress, uh, which the more exercise you do, the more oxygen you're breathing, the more stress you're putting on your muscles, uh, the foods that we eat and fruits and vegetables help your body fight against that. The second component is getting a variety of colors. Uh, and again, that's going with the plant-based foods. So your fruits and vegetables, the more variety of colors, you've probably heard somebody recommend eat the rainbow. So as you look at the reds, the blues, the orange, yellow, white, blue, purple, um, the more of those variety of colors you get, the more nutrients you get that help you respond to that stress that you're putting in your body. Eating fresh foods, so including herbs and spices to add flavor. Besides adding flavor, uh, they actually provide more quality to your, to your diet to help you deal with the stress and immune function in your body. Omega-3s, uh, those are found found in fatty fish. So things like salmon and tuna uh, are a great thing to include in your regular diet. Uh, some nuts will have it as well, like walnuts. Uh, and then the last piece is aim for 30 to 40 grams of fiber per day. The way you do that is have fruit and vegetables every time you eat. And when you talk about grains, when you talk about carbohydrate-based foods, uh, you look for whole grains. So whole grain oats, whole grain pasta, uh, getting whole wheat bread instead of white bread. Uh, the more of those type of foods we're eating, the easier it is to reach that 30 to 40 grams of fiber in a day. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like to do here is talk about the most common mistakes I see athletes make. Uh, and some of it is nutritionally, uh, some of it's not, um, but the piece that's not really nutrition related then in turn impacts how we eat as well. So these are five common mistakes that can hurt your performance, hurt your development, and work against the goals that you have for yourself. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, the number one mistake I see is recovery after training and recovery after competition not being taken seriously enough. So the acute effect of resistance exercise, so lifting weights, uh, you see muscle breakdown. So skeletal muscle protein degradation, that's muscle breakdown. That's elevated for one to two days, 24 to 48 hours. The response to building muscle is called skeletal protein muscle synthesis. Um, so that protein synthesis that occurs can be elevated for 48 hours as well. However, that breakdown is higher than the building up. Uh, so if we're not putting the right food in after that workout, then that protein balance will remain negative. What that means is you're not gonna see the muscle growth, the muscle development uh, that you want from that workout. So you just did the workout, but you're not gonna get the results that you want if we're not putting the right foods in around that workout. The way our body should respond uh, is we want to see amino acids into the bloodstream after that workout. When we have a decrease in circulating levels of amino acids, that leads to greater levels of protein breakdown or protein degradation. Uh, it has an effect on the muscle by causing the muscle to pull amino acids from the muscle uh, and put it into the bloodstream. So you're breaking down muscle to bring that level of amino acids back up. If we eat or drink a protein source, 
then that's going to flood the bloodstream with amino acids. When we have more circulating levels of amino acids, that causes the body in turn to respond by turning on protein synthesis. So repair of that muscle, building of muscle. Uh, and that increase in amino acids in the bloodstream are then directed to the muscle. Uh, so we can use those amino acids as we say bricks in building a wall, but in this case, it's amino acids building the muscle. Uh, so consuming, the goal is going to be con to consume high quality protein immediately after the resistance exercise training, and that's going to increase muscle protein synthesis by raising the amount of amino acids found in the bloodstream. Uh, the type of protein uh, uh, matters. We want high quality protein, meaning it has all of the essential amino acids. Um, so with that high quality protein, my general recommendation is a milk-based protein. Um, milk has all the amino acids that your muscles need, and it has a high of one particular amino acid, leucine, uh, which does a lot more in stimulating that protein synthesis. A second component um, to finishing exercise is we want carbohydrates to refuel. It does more than just refuel, so we'll talk about that, but uh, we do want to replace the energy that you use during that workout. So when we talk about carbohydrate, timing matters. Uh, so consuming carbohydrate before and during resistance exercise helps maintain uh, what I have labeled here is glycogen stores. What that is, is your fuel tank. Uh, so your body runs on carbohydrates. It runs on glucose. That's what your muscle and your brains prefer to use as a fuel source. So that's similar uh, to gasoline for a car. So these glycogen stores are like that gas tank in your car. Uh, so having carbohydrates before and during the resistance training session uh, allows for better maintenance of those glycogen stores. Uh, if we have carbohydrates during, so the way you can do during would be a sports drink, um, having something like gummies. Um, those would be easy things to have during a exercise session that reduces uh, how much cortisol is released during the exercise. So then that reduces how much muscle breakdown occurs. So you have less that you have to recover from. Then consuming carbohydrate immediately after improves protein balance, also by decreasing that muscle breakdown. Uh, the easiest way that I see athletes get carbohydrates in right after exercise is through a recovery drink. Uh, so the example that I love using is chocolate milk because you have the added carbohydrates in the chocolate milk, uh, and then you have the amino acids that you need from the protein that's found in the milk. So that's why chocolate milk is generally recommended uh, for recovery. It re again, provides all the essential amino acids your body needs for repair and the added carbohydrates help refuel and promote that good hormonal environment for proper or optimal recovery. So now timing of carbohydrates matter and then the second component is the type of carbohydrate. Uh, so when we look at when you're having carbohydrates, that really dictates what type of carbohydrates you should have. So immediately around that exercise, the quicker to digest, easier to digest carbohydrates that have less fiber uh, are your best choices. Uh, but then the rest of the day, so when we're talking about hours away from that exercise, we want more complex carbohydrates. We want higher fiber carbohydrates. So some great examples of foods that are more complex or higher in fiber to have throughout the day would be oats or oatmeal, pasta, rice, potatoes. And with potatoes, it doesn't matter what type. Uh, they could be your white baking potato. They could be your little red potatoes that people boil and roast. Uh, it could be sweet potatoes. Uh, all of them are great sources of carbohydrate. Uh, quinoa is a good one. And then all fruits and even, I didn't put it on here, but vegetables like corn and peas are starchy uh, vegetables that are a great source of carbohydrates as well. A third component of recovery uh, is dealing with inflammation. So we talked about 
uh, repairing muscle damage from training. We talked about refueling uh, with carbohydrates. Now inflammation. Uh, so the more intense the exercise is, the more inflammatory of a response your body's going to have, which then can decrease blood flow to that uh, worked muscle. So we need to reduce that inflammation to allow better blood flow and better recovery to occur. Uh, uh, so generally, uh, foods that are high in antioxidants help reduce inflammation. Uh, so I got examples here from vegetable category, fruits, uh, nuts, and even beverages uh, like green tea or cherry juice. Uh, milk itself is actually anti-inflammatory too. Um, but with these picking foods that you like in this category and eating it throughout the day, um, but having in the, the full meal that you have after your workout will help reduce that inflammation and allow for a, a little bit better recovery process. <clears throat> now, mistake number two. Um, I see it way too often, and people definitely don't make this a priority like they should, is inadequate amount of sleep. On average, you need between nine to 11 hours as a high school student. I've seen some studies that suggest even as high as 12 hours of sleep throughout the day. That doesn't mean 11 hours consecutively, um, but the more consecutive hours of sleep you can get, the better. Uh, but inadequate amounts of sleep has been shown to decrease muscle gain and increase fat gain. So generally the opposite of what athletes are trying to have. Uh, so focusing just on getting consistent good night's sleep can greatly impact the results that you see from your training. If you're only getting five hours of sleep at night, then you could be wasting all that time that you have training and not seeing results just from simply not getting enough sleep. Uh, you should aim for eight hours of sleep. And if you get more, great, get more. Um, but aim for eight hours of sleep each night and getting enough will be absolutely essential for the body to maintain optimal function. Because when you sleep, that impacts growth hormone levels. Uh, you go through multiple cycles of uh, sleep at night. And as you get into what's called rapid eye movement sleep, so REM sleep, you have pulses of growth hormone. If we're not getting enough hours of sleep, you're not going through enough cycles, your body's not going to be exposed to enough growth hormone. Uh, if you get too little sleep, you have higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol, which we've already talked about causing muscle breakdown. Also, lack of sleep uh, has been shown that we tend to eat more uh, when we don't get enough sleep but not just eat more, uh, we tend to crave things like sugar and fat, uh, which helps contribute to uh, um, more fat storage. Uh, so it's absolutely imperative that we focus on sleep and get into a good routine of having at least eight hours of sleep per night. Common mistake number three, uh, is not spacing food out or not distributing the food that we eat appropriately throughout the day. Uh, so when we talk about food distribution, I generally focus on protein. Um, with protein, uh, there's a certain quantity that you need throughout the day that's based on body weight. Uh, and then we like to split that up uh, multiple times throughout the day. Uh, you'll see much better results if you space your protein out at least over three meals, but ideally four or five times uh, that we're spacing the protein out. If you had all of your protein at one setting, you would see some results, uh, but then we would have more muscle repair and muscle growth occur if you take and space that protein three or four times throughout the day. So how much do we need? It all depends on how much you weigh. Uh, so take your body weight and this is in kilograms. So to convert it to pounds, divide your body weight by, uh, or to convert it to kilograms, divide your body weight by 2.2. .2. Uh, 
uh, and that'll convert to kilograms. Now you're going to multiply that by 0.4, and that'll tell you your target of grams of protein per meal. Uh, on average, for most people, it's going to fit between 20 and 30 grams. If you weigh more, if you're an offensive lineman on the football team and you're carrying more weight, then you may need more than 30 grams. Uh, so it, it is body weight dependent. And then we should try to eat that quantity uh, every two to four hours. But basically, if you can do that three to five times in the day, uh, then that allows for you to have enough time to go to sleep and get adequate sleep as well. If we can do that three to five times in a day, then you'll meet your protein goals. The best sources of protein, uh, when I talk about sources, I'm looking for quality protein. So that's providing all the essential amino acids that your body needs. Uh, the best sources are animal-based. So it was an animal or it came from an animal. Uh, examples being chicken, turkey, fish, beef and pork. Um, when you eat those types of food, you're eating the muscle. And that has the amino acids that you need for developing the muscle you're trying to, to develop. Or the second component, it came from animals. So eggs, milk, yogurt, cheese, uh, those also have the same uh, amino acids that we're looking for in order to see the elevation of amino acids in the bloodstream and help you build and repair the muscle that we're trying to recover from the workouts. Then after we look at types, now we wanna look for the leaner choices. Uh, and the way we do that generically is just count the legs. The fewer the legs, the better. Uh, so fish has no legs, uh, chicken and turkey have two, then beef and pork have four. So as you do that, we should have fish more often throughout the week than beef and pork. All of them are good, um, but it's best if we try to go with the leaner ones first. Uh, now, there are exceptions to that rule. Uh, things like shrimp and crab and lobster are very lean, uh, and they do have more legs. Um, but in general, count the legs, and that'll give you a good idea of what your lean uh, source of protein is. Now, when we talk distribution, the green portion of this graph shows you what the average American typically does with protein throughout the day. Gets a little bit at breakfast, um, maybe they had a bowl of cereal, um, gets a little bit more at lunch, and then they eat a lot at dinner. Uh, then if you look to the right in the blue, uh, that's going to be a balanced distribution. All, both sides have 90 grams of protein in the day. Um, but the one on the right is evenly distributed. And you can see that gold bar across, across the top of the graph. That's the range that is signifying maximum protein synthesis or optimal recovery and development of that muscle. Uh, so when we hit that 30 gram target in this example, uh, you're maximally stimulating that protein synthesis three times during the day versus in that unbalanced distribution, you only do it once. Uh, so the example on the right is going to be your best strategy when we're looking at maximally recovering from your workouts and seeing results from your workouts. The reason for this is when we talked with workouts and how protein breakdown will be elevated more than protein synthesis. Uh, that black line on the right is balanced. Anything below uh, the black line uh, signifies that we are in muscle protein breakdown. Uh, so we're not getting above that balance point to stimulate uh, muscle growth or development. So in the unbalanced distribution, you can see that we finally get above uh, that balance line after dinner. Now, when we evenly distribute it throughout the day, then we're getting above that black line three separate times. So you can see uh, more de development uh, from your workouts. So it is very important that we do our best to get adequate protein multiple times throughout the day and not just focus on one meal, not just focus post-workout, not just focus at dinner, but do it 
multiple times throughout the day. <clears throat> Mistake number four, and this is high school through college, uh, is just not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Uh, both fruit and vegetables provide carbohydrates, uh, provides energy for your workouts. They also provide the necessary vitamin and minerals that you need for optimal health, optimal physical performance. Uh, if you're not healthy, then you can't play. Uh, so it's important that we're getting those in. Uh, they have other uh, nutrients called phytonutrients. Uh, examples of those are flavonoids, anthocyanins, zeaxanthin, lycopene, beta carotene, these can impact performance in other ways. Uh, for example, the zeaxanthin, uh, getting adequate amounts of that have been shown to improve visual processing speed. Uh, and that is important for sports like tennis and baseball and softball, lacrosse, where you have to pick up a ball moving very fast. Uh, the quicker you can pick it up and respond and react, uh, the better your performance can be. Uh, so when we look at these nutrients, you have varying amounts uh, in the different colors of, of food that we eat. Uh, so that's where we talked to earlier about getting a variety of colors. Uh, and I always tell people, make sure you get a green food every day. And then we, throughout the week, try to balance out the other colors, but try to get something from the green category every day. The next couple slides has uh, those foods split by colors. So generally what I tell athletes is look at the colors, find at least one food that you like in every single color and get those throughout the week. Uh, for the athletes I've worked with the most, the red category is generally the easiest for them to pick out because uh, it's real simple to get apples. Uh, they tend to eat a lot of uh, pasta and you get the tomato sauce uh, or they like Mexican food and have salsa. So the red category is usually pretty easy, um, but we need to get throughout the week, every, every color covered. But every day we wanna get something from the green. And the reason for that, I generally say is if you pick name one vitamin, one mineral, you're going to find it in that green category. Uh, so we want to have the green foods every day and then make sure we, throughout the rest of the week, balance out the rest of the colors as well. Okay, the last common mistake that I see is inadequate uh, fluid intake. So with our fluid, uh, your body is about 60% water. So that's why it's so important that we're drinking enough fluid. Your brain is 85% water. Your muscle is 75% water. Uh, so if we're not drinking enough, it can slow down your metabolism by up to 10%. It can also risk increase your risk of muscle injuries. Uh, the visual example analogy that I like to give around dehydration is compare a piece of steak to beef jerky. If you pull and twist that steak uh, it, and let go of it, it returns to its normal shape. If you do that to beef jerky, it'll either stay bent or twisted or it'll break off. And the main difference between the two is just the amount of water between them. Uh, so obviously you're not gonna have muscles get to the point of beef jerky, um, but it is a good example of the less water you have in that muscle, the more likely you're gonna cause damage to that muscle as you stretch it, as you start to do athletic movement. So it's very important that we're drinking enough. Besides uh, prevention of injury, uh, it also, inadequate amount of fluid also increases your risk of heat illness. So you can see the performance start to decline with dehydration. You can see risk of heat illness increase with dehydration. And as we get into the summer, uh, into the hot months of July, August, September, um, it's very important that we're staying on top of that. Uh, so as we look at sweat loss and the amount of body weight and fluid that you're sweating out, you can see the side effects uh, as that percentage of body weight increases. 
So in the one to two percent dehydrated range, uh, you see a decreased ability to cool. So that's what that means by thermoregulatory ability. Uh, so your sweat cools you off as you lose more water and decrease the amount of circulating water you have, uh, your ability to cool off decreases. And then when we get above 2% dehydration, uh, you start to see reduced muscular endurance. Then when we get to 4%, that's generally when we start to see your strength decline, you still have reduced endurance, but then we start having heat cramps. And then this is when it starts to get very serious. Uh, and then you can lead to ultimately heat exhaustion, heat stroke, coma, death, if we're not paying attention to hydration. Uh, and the way you calculate percent dehydration is when somebody's adequately hydrated, you have their weight, and then you weigh them post-exercise uh, to see how much weight they sweated out. So if a 200-pound athlete lost two pounds out of a, during a workout, that's 1% dehydration. If they lost six pounds, now they're at 3% dehydrated. Uh, and during these summer months, especially with football with pads, um, it's absolutely essential that we pay attention to this to keep athletes healthy. So hydration strategy to prevent problems. Uh, so first, take your body weight in pounds, divide it in half. That's the total fluid estimated, total fluid needed per day baseline. Uh, that doesn't count uh, replacing sweat loss. Uh, that's just baseline needs. So then I broke it down simply assuming that <clears throat> people are sleeping eight hours. <clears throat> then if you weigh 150 pounds and you drink five ounces every hour, then you'll drink enough. If you weigh 200 pounds, you drink seven to eight ounces every hour, you'll get enough for that baseline needs. Now we have to take into account the amount that you sweat out as well. So if you know how much pounds of sweat you lost during a workout, then it's as simple as drinking an additional 20 to 24 ounces uh, for every pound that you lost on top of your baseline needs. Uh, another way to do it, once you calculate what your typical sweat loss is, uh, if you know you typically lose just one pound every practice, uh, then add two ounces uh, to your hourly rate, and then, then you'll be good for main, maintenance of your total fluid needs. <clears throat> One fun fact, uh, milk actually has more electrolytes than sports drinks per eight ounces. Uh, most people don't realize that, um, but a typical sport, sports drink in and eight ounces has anywhere from 75 to 110 milligrams of sodium. Uh, milk has 125. Uh, typical sports drink has 30 to 60 milligrams of potassium. Uh, milk has 365 milligrams of potassium, and then it also has 300 milligrams of calcium for every eight ounces. And the combination of the electrolytes in milk and the carbohydrates found in milk allow for better rehydration than just water. Uh, you'll lose more water through your kidneys if you just drink straight water after workouts than what you would get from having milk. So now questions I get from high school students and college athletes all the time is what about supplements? I'll say supplements are not, and I'll repeat, not a substitute for a good diet. Um, there's way too many problems with supplements, and I want to give you warnings about the problems that I see with supplements. Um, but uh, in general, the definition uh, supplement is a vitamin, mineral, amino acid, herb, or other botanical uh, dietary supplements and ergogenic aids um, are what athletes are looking at. And that can include sports drinks, protein bars, and the one category I see way too often with high school students is energy drinks. Uh, even though you're buying them at a grocery store, those are supplements and those are not regulated and something you got to watch out for. So back in 1994, 
Congress passed uh, an act called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, and it placed dietary supplements in its own category separate from foods and drugs. So that decreased how much regulation occurs in dietary supplements. So now the FDA relies on supplement manufacturers to ensure the safety of their products before it reaches a consumer. Um, so they don't have to, the manufacturer doesn't have to prove they're safe before they sell them to you. Then the FDA only acts when a supplement has been identified as unsafe after it's been on the market. So that means there's had to have a lot of problems with that supplement um, before the FDA even starts to investigate. So supplement manufacturers start selling their product to you, uh, but they don't have to prove that it's safe. They don't have to prove that they work. They don't have to prove that they have enough of the ingredients listed to actually uh, work. Like for instance, if it's something like creatine has been shown to help with muscle strength, um, they don't have to prove they have enough creatine in there, just that they have creatine. Uh, so this is a huge problem uh, with athletes that are looking for things to help them out. Um, and bigger problem is the amount of contaminated products that I've seen. Uh, so the issues you have to be aware of, spiking, adulteration, and cross-contamination. Um, spiking is where a manufacturer specifically adds raw material to its formulation so it can produce an effect. Uh, so this is where supplement companies add banned ingredients. Uh, and you hear about college athletes failing drug tests from dietary supplements. Uh, and it doesn't have to be on the label. Uh, adulterations where a product is contaminated with inferior material to help it pass analytical tests. And this is where companies have been caught using human hair as their protein source instead of using something like whey protein, uh, but it's marketed as it's whey protein. Cross-contamination is accidental. Um, this is where there's inadvertent contamination due to poor manufacturing conditions or poor cleaning process. So this is where it's a company could manufacture a banned substance and then uh, produce what's not supposed to be banned, but because they didn't clean properly, some of that banned substance got into the uh, product that shouldn't have had it in there. And this happens in the US, but it also happens overseas like China where a majority of our raw materials are manufactured. So when you look at dietary supplements, a lot of the products that we get, the ingredients in that product are shipped in from overseas and not made here in the US where we have tighter regulations and our regulations are still not great in this category. So it is a real concern. A recent study showed that 15% of supplements purchased around the world were contaminated or adulterated with steroids. When you look specifically at just the ones purchased in the US, it was higher. It was at 19%. And these products were labeled as amino acids, creatine, HMB, things that should be fine. But uh, since we don't have the regulation around our products, uh, you have almost a 20% chance that you're gonna get something that's gonna cause problems. And these contaminated products could jeopardize health, they could jeopardize eligibility in a drug-tested athlete. So what I recommend to help avoid that is look for third-party tested uh, products. Um, so for instance, NFL, Major League Baseball requires all products in their clubhouse to be NSF certified for sport. So that's one uh, that I go to first. Uh, so look for it to have that logo on the bottle if you're gonna uh, take something. Uh, vitamins, I generally look for United States Pharmacopeia verified, so that's the USP. Uh, other third-party testing, informed choice, banned substance control group. Um, you look for these, uh, so that way you know that it's been tested, uh, you're getting what you think you're getting, uh, and, and you're, you're greatly reducing your risk of getting, getting a contaminated product. <clears throat> so lastly, uh, rules that I encourage athletes to live by. 
Uh, one, eat breakfast daily. Uh, then we're going to eat every few hours from there. Uh, so that way you eat four times a day. Um, depends on how many hours you're up, possibly five or six. Uh, try to get the least processed foods. So these are going to be throughout the day, you're getting foods that are higher in fiber. Get that variety of colors in. Include a lean protein source every meal. So this is that protein distribution, spacing out your protein throughout the day. Um, have that combination of carbohydrates and protein before and after workouts. Uh, so again, providing fuel and providing the optimal hormonal environment for your body to adapt to that workout. And lastly, stay hydrated. Uh, so if you live by these rules, uh, with your workout and sleep habits, then you'll see the development that you're trying to see. And next few slides, I put together a simple scorecard that you can rate yourself. So you're going to answer yes or no uh, to all these questions and then count up your yeses. Uh, when you count your yeses, once you total it up, you can see where you fit, uh, whether you're a state champ, whether you're a district champ, or uh, better, not, better luck next year. Um, and then the simple thing is if you do that on a regular basis, you look for your nose, and then that's, that's the area you need to focus on. So if you answered no to a question, then your focus is to turn that to a yes. So did you eat breakfast? Did you eat four to six times a day? Um, and then you can read these, but... As you go through, you'll see here are 12 questions. Uh, and then you count up your yeses. And if you answered yes 10 to 12 times, hey, you're state champ. Nutritionally, you're doing what you need uh, to be that state champ. Uh, if it's only seven to nine, hey, you're, you did fine, you're district champ, but you got room to work on. If you're getting less than seven yeses, uh, that's a 50%. If you're getting 50% or below, then we have a lot of work. Um, you're not going to see the results that you ultimately want to see. Uh, so we have to work on those, turning those no's into yeses. So from here, if you have questions, I'll gladly uh, take your questions. Just shoot me an email. It's listed above. And then I'm going to turn it over to Callie and she'll talk about other resources that are available to you to help you with your nutrition questions. Yes, thank you so much, Randy. That was so awesome and such a, you know, sharing your wealth of knowledge on sports nutrition, I think is so valuable for our high school athletes as they are trying to work towards their athletic goals. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone that um, our viewers that they where they can find more resources. So first place is you can find more resources on sports nutrition specifically on the VHSL sports nutrition webpage. Um, we are always updating that. We have a few videos on there. Randy has a great smoothie video on there. Um, more information on why chocolate milk is a good choice to recover. Um, so if you're wanting more of that, head there. And then also if you have questions specifically on dairy nutrition, um, you can head to our website, thedairyalliance.com. You can learn more about specifically dairy nutrition there. Lastly, we would love to hear feedback um, from what you took away from this webinar. Um, we really want to hear you know, what, what your thoughts are. So if you could please look to the description under this video and you can find a survey link. Um, and that's going to link you to a survey with just a few questions to give us a little bit of feedback as we move forward with this partnership with the VHSL. Thank you so much for attending. And thank you again to Randy for a great webinar. Have a great day, everyone.